Hey, what's poppin', guys? It is I, Deldry, back with some more Radiant Dawn 0% Gross, and today we're gonna move right on into Chapter 1-3 as well as Chapter 1-4. Before we do that, though, I actually want to make a few clarifications based on some of the comments I was seeing. So go ahead and consider these next few minutes to be a short part zero of sorts, I suppose. Uh, just for clarity's sake, though, this is in fact a no-transfers playthrough. Now, just to very quickly catch everybody up to speed, in case you are not familiar, uh, by playing the previous game through to its conclusion and having a character reach max level as well as capping out any particular stat, you can actually get a small boost to that stat in Radiant Dawn by transferring the stat over. There's an option in the menu, you just click a button and bam, you're done. Now, the boost per stat is a plus two to a given stat, with the exception of HP, which is a plus five. Now, in the context of a low turn count playthrough, this does have some serious implications. Doubly so, in our case, right, this is a 0% gross playthrough where every single stat point matters quite a bit. Uh, just to give you guys a few examples of some things that might change, the first thing that comes to mind is stat booster distribution, where uh, we're sort of forced to make certain decisions with those. Now, there is some flexibility. I don't think that uh, there's no room to sort of play around with these things, but just to give you an example, we are forced to give a speed wings to a certain character, otherwise the game quite literally becomes unbeatable. And that doesn't happen with the plus two that you would receive from a transfer boost to that character. Again, just as an example. It's even more obvious with a character like Soth, who in fact transfers one to one from Path of Radiance, uh, with the exception of HP, that's capped at 40 but everything else he could potentially have 20 in, at base. And that has huge durability implications, right? So our Soth has 35 HP, 14 defense, 9 res, uh, with 18 strength. Now a transfer Soth could have 40 HP, 20 strength, 20 defense, 20 resistance, 20 skill, you know, it just, it's a, it's a very drastic difference. I, I guess that's the point I wanted to illustrate. And we're not gonna be taking advantage of that. Now the save file that I used for this is not my own, I grabbed it off gamefacts.com. And this save file did actually have transfer boosts enabled for some characters, however I just edited the ISO and took those out. So the characters we're going to be using do have the correct base stats as if this were a no transfers playthrough. Uh, in full transparency, and uh, although this doesn't actually change anything in context of the run, uh, you do get a slight weapon rank experience boost based on what your weapon rank was in Path of Radiance when you transfer over to Radiant Dawn. And, like I say, this doesn't actually change anything for this playthrough. We're never going to be in a situation where we're using a weapon that we couldn't have ordinarily used because of the boost. I am 100% certain that it changes nothing. You don't even get a small hit or critical boost for having a high weapon rank in this game. No shenanigans there. It's just, it's just a determining factor for what weapons you can use and nothing else. Now, I will leave a list of characters who might be affected by this in the description below, along with the rules for this challenge. And one final thing, I did actually change Micaiah's gross to be plus one strength as opposed to plus one luck like they were in the first part. I did end up replaying the first three maps as a result of this, but ultimately things are more or less exactly the same. And just for consistency's sake, I felt like I should make that change before we get too far into the playthrough. Uh, but enough talk, bro. Let's move right along. Chapter three, part one. So we've been thrown in prison now. We saw that guy Gerard on the previous map, and he has a bit of a vendetta against the silver-haired maiden Micaiah. Fortunately, our friends, the Dawn Brigade, are here to bail us out yet again, and we've even made some new allies along the way. We'll talk about them in a second. Real quick, though, you did see me check that soldier in the bottom of the map there immediately upon starting the map. Now, we actually don't need anything special from that soldier at all. Uh, just muscle memory kicking in again. At first, I thought that we needed him to have 9 defense, but it turns out that we don't. Uh, Ilyana can finish that guy off if so should happen to fail, so his stats here are totally irrelevant. We're gonna start the party off by trading the Thonic spell over to Micaiah and then shoving her such that on the next turn she'll be able to help chip in against the archer near the door. Soth is then gonna follow that up by knocking out that first fighter in order to make it safe for the rest of our guys to move in. Now we do see Soth and Micaiah's support kick in right there. It's a pretty good support and it comes completely for free. Uh, it gives plus two attack as well as 15 evade, which is gonna be useful for a map like this because we do need Soth to remain healthy, but we're not gonna have any time to heal him. We're gonna have to rely on his natural evasion to hopefully pull this off. Now the enemies can have anywhere between 20 to 50 hit on average. I know that seems like a very wide range, but that's just that lovely biorhythm mechanic coming in yet again, man. Now you're seeing us shove around Ilyana a whole bunch here. We'll get into her in a second. She's quite good. Uh, but we also need her to chip in on this archer that's blocking up the door. And we're also going to direct our allies into a specific tile such that uh, Amy's going to take the front lines, unfortunately for her. And she's going to be backed up by Kurth, who will block off that choke point. 
Now, I don't know who this Kurth guy is. He's just a traveler from what I understand. But he has very beastly stats. High HP and very high defense. Absolutely nothing abnormal about him, though. Nope, just like he says, he's a traveler. Now, we're able to take this archer out simply thanks to the fact that we picked up that Thani on the previous map. You may have thought that we were going to use it for super effective damage against the knights or the cavalier boss on this map. But no, we just need it for the extra firepower. It is actually five points stronger than Micaiah's light spell. So that's easily her most damaging option at this point by far. Now, as I say, our allied units are about to move as we previously directed, and Amy is going to get worked over like nothing else, good lord. She is so done. But her contributions are heavily appreciated here because that is going to keep the heat off of us as we break to the right here. Now, this soldier is going to come for Soth, and uh, we are able to take him out in this instance, and Ileana would be in range to finish him off should uh, we encounter a situation where he survives. In this case, though, none of that is necessary as Soth is able to simply take him out clean. Now, this is another escape map, and once again, we just need to merely escape with Micaiah and Micaiah alone. You'll see that we're sort of moving her towards the bottom of the map, and that is where the escape point is. Uh, on this next turn, we are going to set up sort of a shield formation to protect her, because at this point, uh, if it breathes, it can probably kill her. Like, instantly. Instantly. If not in a single hit, then in two. And she is very slow. So from here on forward, we're just going to need to protect her as best as possible. You'll see us set up sort of a shield formation to force the enemies through the forest if they were to attempt to attack her, but they're not going to be able to reach from where she's going to end up here on the next turn. And now we can go ahead and briefly touch on Ilyana right quick. She has a very strong start, I would say. Uh, an incredibly strong start, in fact. She's one of the best units we have at our disposal for the next few maps, in fact. The Dawn Brigade sort of has this weird issue where the units that you receive sort of leapfrog each other over and over. Like, we get Ilyana here, but then... Uh, in a few maps from now, we'll actually get a promoted Sage, who's even better than Ilyana. In the context of a 0% growth playthrough, though, her contributions are absolutely invaluable. She has a very solid base speed, which is going to prevent her from being doubled even on the next map from uh, 14 attack speed enemies. Some of our characters are going to start having trouble with that very, very quickly here, and Ilyana does not. Ironically, she's one of the better characters to have on the front line because she deals solid enough damage with her, uh, with her Thunder Spells or Elf Thunder Spells. And she has enough defense to not be getting one shot at this point, so in combination with her high speed, we don't really have to worry about her. She has solid enough concrete durability. Uh, despite the fact she is a mage, you'd think she'd be relatively frail. She actually ends up being one of the better characters to just throw out there, at least for the time being. All in all, I would say she's actually in a very similar position to that of the vanilla version of the game. She makes a very strong first impression, however, she quickly finds herself outclassed by some of the better characters that we will soon get. I will say that I think that because we lack the options that we would have in an ordinary playthrough, I think that her early game advantages are just that much more meaningful in that sense. Now you did see us unequip Leonardo uh, a few moments back, and that is to get the attention of a blue soldier that happened to spawn in on turn 2 I believe. Now he has a javelin so we'll be able to get his attention and his attention alone which is great. Laura needs to talk to him in order to convert him over to our side. And we're setting up to do exactly that right now as the boss is going to come for Soth. Now, we don't actually have to deal with this guy, and I do end up showing the fact that he has a stealable item, the Discipline Scroll. It could have been nice. This is a scroll that doubles weapon experience gain. Uh, if nothing else, we could have sold it for a little bit more gold. We're actually quite strapped for cash in this game throughout most of the adventure, honestly. But unfortunately, there's just simply no time to get it. Now, it's very important that we put Soth next to this Armor Knight here near the escape point. We do need this chip damage in order to take him out with a combination of Ilyana as well as Nolan, who we've been progressing towards this point in the map just for the strict purposes of clearing these guys out of our way. There's also an archer with a longbow on the escape point, but he is fodder for Soth in every sense of the word. We can easily one round KO him, so he's not really much of a consideration. Also of note, with Edward, we did push Micaiah on the previous turn, and this is necessary in order to allow Micaiah to escape on turn 5, in combination with one more push from Edward. Thanks to Leonardo being bad, we're able to get the attention of Aaron and pull him directly into range for Laura to speak to him as we do. Now, Aaron is... Honestly quite forgettable as a character both in the original game as well as in the context of a playthrough like this I know he has his fans and whatnot, but truthfully here. He's just kind of there Honestly, the most I could say about him is just he's a warm body in many instances now He does have it better than a certain other character that we'll be recruiting on the next map He's not in immediate danger of being doubled on his joint chapter or anything like that God forbid they give you a unit like that am I right? but truth be told uh, the power level of the Dawn Brigade, at least in terms of Act 1, is going to start increasing so rapidly that there's not really time for him to do much of anything. 
He does have a few niche uses on the next map, but after that, he's mostly relegated to shoving and things of that nature, unfortunately. Uh, come part three, he will have a use or two, but that's, again, only due to the fact that we won't have some of those powerhouses that we'll have throughout the remainder of Act 1 at our disposal. So, we'll, we're essentially, again, just using him as a warm body, even in those instances. Nothing really wrong with Aaron as a character, but sadly, he's just not that useful. For us, anyways. At any rate, with one more push for Big Ed here, we can get Micaiah's butt all the way over to the escape point right now. And with that, Chapter 3 is done in five turns. Moving right along, let's just go ahead and jump right on into Chapter 4, A Distant Voice. Now, this is probably one of the first notable challenges that you may experience when playing this game for yourself. Like on a first time playthrough or anything, the enemies on this stage tend to be quite a bit more powerful than those that we've been seeing as of late. Which we will view for ourselves in a moment here. First things first though, this is our first chapter where we have the base available. Now there's several things we can do here from building up our support ranks to forging items, uh, viewing info conversations and things like that. The first thing we're going to do here is actually forge two times. We're going to start with an iron axe and forge maximite as well as 10 extra hit just for a little bit more reliability. We're going to go ahead and drop that on Nolan. That's going to really fix up his hit rate issues that he's been having, as well as give him a weapon that's not only lighter, so he's not being weighed down finally, but also a little bit stronger as well. That'll certainly help him contribute on this next map, where enemies tend to have a bit more evasion. We'll also go ahead and do the same thing for Soth by forging him up this iron knife with max might and a little bit of extra hit rate just to help out uh, his reliability a little bit. Now, knives in this game are actually 1 to 2 range, so that's obviously a very useful trait, especially on a unit as capable as Soth is. Following that, we're going to go ahead and buy the Beast Killer from the shop. We can actually only buy the one. Radiant Dawn has a system where they have these bargains that change from chapter to chapter, and you can get some rare and special items by doing that. I actually really like this system, honestly, and we definitely want to get this Beast Killer for reasons that will soon become apparent, I'm sure. The Beast Killer is also a pretty nice weapon in general. It is the strongest knife that Soth will be able to use for quite some time, and it also has quite a bit of built-in crit rate, so he might be able to get some cheese going with that. <laughs> it's generally just a useful weapon to have, though. Uh, we're going to get this info conversation as well. Now, this is actually a character recruitment, which is why I'm leaving this in at all. It just gives me a little bit more time to talk about this character. Now... By selecting that first info conversation, you get access to Meg. Now, Meg ordinarily is such a hated character, arguably one of the worst characters in the entire game in terms of a normal playthrough. But little did you guys know that in terms of 0% growth, Meg is actually top dog, leader of the pack, easily, and I do mean easily, one of the greatest and most powerful allies that we could add to our cause. I'm not sure that you guys are truly prepared for the destruction and havoc that she's capable of wreaking on her foes. And I am, of course, full of shit. Meg is so bad. There's all of one enemy on the next map that isn't capable of double attacking her, and that includes the more powerful variants, which double attack and straight up one round KO her. Incidentally, the very first one of them that we'll be seeing does not double her ever that I've seen. So she will be used a little bit coming up here. But aside from that, man, good lord, just venture, honestly. Imagine using one of the worst characters in the game, normally, without any growth rate. So she has no hope of ever getting better. That said, after some last minute item management, we're just about ready to kick this off. Of note, we also saw me get a support between Nolan and Leonardo during the base sequence there. And that's going to be immediately useful here as we start Chapter 4 proper. We're going to start the map off by attacking this tiger with both Micaiah and Ilyana, although as you can see Micaiah is fairly exposed. Uh, this is the tiger I was talking about when I said that not every single enemy on the map doubles Meg right off the bat. This guy is the one and only exception. Now the reason we picked up that support with Nolan and Leonardo is so that Nolan would be able to one shot this wall here. Uh, fun fact about axes in this game, they do super effective damage against breakable walls and doors. However, despite that fact, Nolan is actually just one point shy without that support. So that's exactly why we got that. So that we would be able to push Soth far forward on the first turn like that. Soth is going to go to town on these guys because that Beast Killer is super effective against all of the enemies on this map, provided that they are transformed. Now, I haven't really talked too much about these guys as enemies. Now, these are Lagoos, and they have some very interesting mechanics to them that I would say make them a little bit more challenging if not interesting to actually fight as compared to some of the other enemies that we've been facing lately. 
uh, namely their transformation gauge. Now, Lagoos do not always have access to their full power. They have to transform in order to uh, be the biggest threat possible. In fact, while they're in their untransformed state, they are relatively harmless. Their stats are very low, and they're not even capable of initiating combat all on their own. However, once transformed, their stats will all double and they become a fearsome threat indeed. Now, I'll get into that a little bit more specifically because we do take advantage of their transformation gauge uh, in one case in particular, but it has some unique quirks to it that make it fairly exploitable. First things first, though, we're going to take that chest key that Soth received on the first turn by killing that untransformed cat, and we're going to give that over to Leonardo, who's then going to attack the boss. Now, we do need to get some chip damage with Leonardo because Soth must take this guy out from this tile and no other tile in order for this strategy to work. We need to do this because if we don't move towards the right-hand side of the map right here, we're not actually going to be able to draw in the next transformed tiger over on the right-hand side of the map. And we need to do this in order to make it safe for the rest of our characters down south to go treasure hunting, essentially, because there are some hidden treasures on this map. But with that tiger in the position that he is, he will be able to run up on us and kill us as we go searching through the gold pieces in order to obtain a master seal we obviously want to get that, but there's some annoying frustrations that come with that. Uh, now, as I say, this group in the south is going to start working towards the bottom right-hand side of the map. And we're able to do that with a combination of chip from Micaiah and Nolan to kill one cat. Of course, we can only do this after defeating the tiger that attacked Meg on the previous enemy phase with Ilyana and her Elf Thunder. Uh, speaking of Meg, though, we're going to use her to attack that cat in front of Nolan with a wind edge and we're also gonna throw a javelin with Aaron now as you can see this actually causes the cat to untransform because as I was previously starting to say the Lagoos gauge has a little bit of a quirk to it in that every time you enter combat you lose a little bit of your transformation gauge now right here I do believe I give sort of a visual example and show the gauge decreasing over time on that tiger there and we're actually not gonna end up killing him this looks like a somewhat precarious position uh, however, we're actually able to run that tiger completely dry before he becomes a threat. And this is where that wind edge we picked up earlier is very useful. We can't actually do this without that. And there is no purchasable wind edge before this point, so without having one of those, this strategy does not work. The only other alternative, which is why, I, which is why previously I said it's not strictly necessary to have this wind edge, uh, the alternative would be to get some sort of a critical hit on this tiger or to like dodge or something like that. But because we do have the Wind Edge, we can run him dry. And I do believe that I have shown at this point the slowly decreasing gauge of his. Yes, he's all the way down to two points now. It doesn't matter if we actually connect our attacks. We just need to throw out the attacks. They lose three points per combat, regardless of whether they hit anything, regardless of whether they can counter or not. It does not matter. We just need to get him into combat such that right now he detransforms and becomes completely harmless to us. This, of course, also takes into consideration the fact that Lagoos lose a little bit of their transformation gauge every turn, so long as they are transformed. Now, in the case of Tigers, that is four points per turn. Uh, these numbers I'm throwing out are actually dependent on the type of Lagoos that you are facing as well, so Tigers lose three per combat and four per turn, whereas the Cats we are seeing on this map have a notoriously bad gauge, and they lose five per turn with four per combat. So they're very easy to run dry, comparatively speaking. That also applies to your own Lagoos units as well, so keep that in mind. That said, we're finally starting to wrap things up here. All we need to really do at this point is make sure that we heal up Soth, who basically uh, soloed that entire section of the map by himself. The Beast Killer is just such a huge benefit for him on this map here. Uh, we do need the health on him, though, because there is one final wave of enemies that will spawn in here momentarily. Now, Meg has just moved on to one of the treasure tiles that we're after on this map. There was a chance there. Uh, skill plus biorhythm bonus percent chance that she would find a master seal by waiting on that tile. Now, the biorhythm bonus is pretty important for this because it is the greatest factor in determining our chances of success here. For having good biorhythm, you get a 10% bonus, and for having best biorhythm, you get a 20% bonus. Now, unfortunately, we're not actually able to use Soth to go after either of these two treasures that we want to get here on this map. Uh, the hidden treasures at any rate that is and because Soth is a thief type character he actually gets an additional 60 points in addition to the regular chance of success for finding a hidden item like that unfortunately there's just no viable way to get him to either of these two locations while also clearing this map as fast as possible of all the enemies 
Now, because Soth can't do this for us, that means our next best alternative is to use characters who are on Best Buy or them. In this case, that's going to be Meg and Aaron. Now, we moved Aaron pretty specifically throughout this entire map so that he would be able to sneak by that choke point there on the previous turn. The one occupied by Nolan and a tiger, that is. That way, we'll be able to shove him right now with Nolan, allowing him to search for this first treasure we're going for here. And we get it. It's the Beast Bow. Now, that's a very important skill scroll that you cannot pass up, especially in the context of a playthrough like this. It allows you to deal super effective damage to uh, any Beast Lagoons, essentially. So make sure to get that. Now, Meg fails yet again to get the Master Seal, but Laura gets it, thankfully. There are actually three tiles from which that is possible. Uh, all of them surrounding that healing pot there. So the one that Laura's on, the one that Meg's on, and the one directly below the healing pot all have a chance to give you the Master Seal. With Meg, we had 27% chance per attempt to actually obtain the Master Seal. And with Laura, we had a mere 13% chance. Now the overall chance of finding the Master Seal here is 54% with that combination of moves. Uh, the Beast Bow overall had a 40% chance of success, uh, accounting for the fact that we also had Leonardo, who had one opportunity to search for it. Unfortunately, like I say, there's not a whole lot we can do to actually improve those odds without slowing down and rethinking the entire strategy just so that we can get around this, quite frankly, bullshit mechanic. I do not particularly care for these hidden item mechanics in these games, and I think that in Radiant Dawn it is particularly egregious. Uh, I know that that was not the most reliable thing when accounting for finding both treasures simultaneously, but honestly, I am... I'm willing to fudge that a little bit because, like I say, uh, it doesn't really... It's its not strategic, man. It's just luck. At the end of the day, it's just luck. Even if I use Soth, it would still be luck. Just because he has the highest chance of success does not mean that I'm guaranteed to do it regardless of anything else that I'm doing. I just... I don't know. I know that that's completely arbitrary. And for future hidden treasures, it is actually much more viable to have Soth do the searches, so that helps out as well. And like I say, I don't really care for the hidden treasures mechanic at all. I think that they got it right the first time, man. In Mystery of the Emblem, the first game to do this hidden treasure BS, if you happen to land on the tile that had the treasure, you know what? They just gave it to you. There's no luck check, there's no skill check, no biorhythm check. No, it just gives you the item. I don't know why they ever changed that, but alas, here we are. <laughs> Anyways, uh, ranting aside, we got chapter 4 done in 5 turns. Next time we're obviously going to be moving on to chapter 5. Probably going to be a standalone thing because it's, you know, just a defense map essentially. Anyhow, thank you for watching. Hope that you enjoyed. If you did, you guys know what to do. Leave a like, comment, do whatever you got to do. And I will catch you guys on the next one. See you then. Peace.